here. Oh, well, I'm live. Okay, hi. I'm Kelsey Kovner. Okay. Um, I uh, work at the Wildlife Conservation Society. I'm in charge of this great Google Hangout. This is our animal scientist here at the aquarium. He works both in the aquarium and in the field. And we're going to get to hear a lot of really cool facts and interact with our classes. We have three classes. Um, we have the Ann Sullivan Elementary School fourth grade class. We have a third grade class from Pelham Elementary, and we have a seventh grade class from Ju Bleecker Junior High School. And they're going to be asking some questions shortly. So Hans, would you mind telling us a little bit about where we are? Where we are right now, gang, is we are in the shark holding pools area of the New York Aquarium. As I think some of you guys might know, uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society's New York Aquarium is building a brand new shark exhibit that's going to open in a few years. So uh, we needed a sort of a place for our sharks to live while they were waiting for their new home to be built. And here we are. Right behind us, you can see a bunch of them swimming around. Yeah, you should be able to see them swimming around. They'll come in and out of camera, and we have some better pictures of them in a slide for you guys. So who do we have Who do we have down here? What species of sharks do we have in our exhibit? We have three species of shark in the exhibit and one species of stingray. Down there we have five sand tiger sharks. We have four sand bar sharks, also called brown sharks. And we have five nurse sharks. And we have one rough-tailed stingray. As you guys probably know, stingrays are very close relatives of sharks. All right. Um, so I'm going to let our classes take over, because I don't want to have too much of me on camera. So our first class up is the Ann Sullivan Elementary School. It's a fourth grade class. So we have some questions from them. So are you guys ready? Mrs. Funk, are you ready with your class to ask some questions? Are they, are they moving around? Okay. I'll try and fix it. But I... Are any of the classes moving around? Are the classes moving around? Yes. No, I know, but I... Kelly Funk, are you uh, on camera? Can the classrooms hear me still? None of the classrooms are responding. I'm trying to go live with one of the classrooms and nobody's responding. Are they moving? Can the classrooms hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, all right, all right. Uh, thank you. All right, sorry about that, guys. Uh, is Kelly Funk's class ready to ask their questions? All right, let's try. She might not have connectivity right now. So how about our seventh grade class? Are you guys ready? Is our third grade class ready? Yeah. Yeah. Right, go for it. <laughs> if you have your questions, come on up. I, I sent your teacher some questions, so come on up and ask them. Say hi, I'm Jordan. Hi, I'm Jordan. And sharks swim in a large schools of like fish. The question was, do sharks school in large schools like fish? That's a very good question. Thanks for asking it. Um, at certain times of the year, I think sharks do gather in groups, but they don't normally travel in large schools like, like a lot of other fish. They tend to be solitary, and you tend to see 
you know, sharks of a certain size, certain age group, or whether they're boys or girls, all those guys will be sort of in the same area at the same time. But they're never in a big school, except maybe when they're mating, things like that. All right, our next question from that class. The other one, so, um, Ben? Hi, my name is Ben Burrard. How are, why are sharks attracted to blood? Uh, the question was, why are sharks attracted to blood? That's another, that's another really good question. It's not so much that they're attracted to blood, but remember that sharks are predators, right? So a predator is attracted to unusual sights, sounds, smells that might indicate that there is food around. So yes, blood could be something that could attract a shark, but other odors, other bodily odors excluded by fish uh, could also indicate uh, the presence of, of prey and certain sounds in the water as well. So, like most predators, sharks are keyed into like all their senses to where might the food be. Do we have our last question? Can you hear? Hi, I'm Caitlin, and my question is, why do strikes not have scales? Ah, I heard it that time. Thank you. I think it does make a difference having good headsets. Why do sharks not have scales? You know, I think that question stems from the scales. Sharks actually do have scales, but the type of scales that they have are different than those of most other fish. Most other fish have scales that we recognize, whereas sharks have what are called dermal denticles or placoid scales. Dermal denticles are like little teeth in the skin. So they do have scales, they're just very different than that of other fish. All right? Sorry, guys, I think we're having a couple of technical difficulties on our end, but we're trying to work through them. The questions are awesome. All right. Thanks so much for that. As our next class, does, is Miss Kelly Funk's class uh, listening in? Do you guys have your questions ready? How about our seventh grade class? Are you guys on air? All right. I'm going to read our questions out since they sent them to me earlier. We're having, we seem to be having a little bit of some connectivity problems. So, our fourth grade class, uh, someone named Vivian asked, "What do the sharks eat?" Uh. Different sharks eat different things. Uh, in the ocean, they have a very interesting, very varied, very, very. But here at the aquarium, the three types of sharks and the stingray that we have all basically eat the same thing. Uh, they eat here at the aquarium. They either get herring, capelin, which is a type of fish similar to an anchovy or a smelt, or squid. And they get, you know, one day they'll get squid, the next day they'll get herring, the next day they'll get capelin. They also sometimes like as a treat shrimp or clam. The ray, I think, likes the clam better than the other guys. The sharks don't seem to like the clam much. All right, great. All right, and another student, Zach, asked, what is the cause for sharks to lose so many teeth? Wow, these questions are really fantastic. Well, you know, 
let's compare shark teeth to human teeth, right? Our teeth are embedded uh, very solidly in bone, and there's roots and there's all kind of stuff that lock our teeth into place. Remember that sharks don't have any bones. They, their teeth are made of the same stuff that our teeth are made of, but their jaws are made of cartilage, not bone. So when you wiggle your nose, that stuff inside your nose, that's cartilage. Same thing in your knee. Um, so their teeth are not very deeply rooted into their jaw. And I think, you know, if you don't have hands to grab your prey, all you have is a mouth, it probably pays to have an unending supply of teeth and teeth that are not terribly well fixed inside the jaw. So what works for sharks is they use their jaws to bite down on something. If the prey squirms too much and they break a bunch of teeth, no big deal because in a day or two, new teeth will grow back. So it's, um, it's a it's a strategy and an adaptation that's worked very well for millions of years with sharks. All right, and I'm sure you guys are seeing the video we have up right now. That's from our shark tank below us. So hopefully you can all see a shark swimming around, what it looks like down there. Um, and we have one more question from that class, our fourth grade class, Ann Sullivan Elementary School, which was from Anthony, um, which was... Uh, Oh no, sorry, I already asked that question. Uh, and that was the shark's you kind of you kind of overlaid his second question, which was about the bones and how their bones have them survive. But you did just talk about how they're mostly cartilage. So I think we covered Anthony's question. Um, we're gonna move on to our seventh grade class. Just wanna check in if they can hear me. Are you guys do you wanna go live on camera? Looks like somebody's coming up to the screen. Is anyone moving around? Is anyone moving around? All right, I have our seventh grade class. If Erin wants to come up and ask her question, I have Erin, Sophie, or Krista. If any of you guys want to come up and ask your question. All right, I know you guys were on a time crunch, so I'm going to ask them. Um, Aaron asked, uh, how did you get into the field of marine biology and how many different jobs are there in marine biology? You know, that's a big topic, so just, you know, do what you can. Yeah, I'll try and keep that brief. Uh, I was, when I was a little kid, I was always interested in sharks. And I don't know, it's just I'm, I never really grew up. I've been interested in sharks since I was a little bitty. And um, so I went to school, studied marine biology. Uh, worked a lot of jobs that had nothing to do with marine biology and then started volunteering here at the New York Aquarium. And between my college degree and I also learned to scuba dive and things like that and the fact that I volunteered, I ended up with a job here at the New York Aquarium. And if you're going to be a marine biologist, the New York Aquarium, a public aquarium, is a good place to be one. You can also work for the state or the city or the federal government as an environmental consultant. Um, but a lot of marine biologists uh, go on to get their PhDs and they teach at a college or a community college or a university. Um, and in the time in between semesters or in their summers, they do their research. So there's a couple of ways to do it. And there's a picture on the screen of Hans tagging some sharks out in the New York waters, um, which leads into our next question from Sophie, which was, how does the aquarium contribute to helping endangered species? That is a really good question, Sophie. Thank you. Uh, I will say that we do it in a lot of ways. Uh, the, the, one of the things the Wildlife Conservation Society does is it runs 
four zoos and an aquarium in New York City that are open to the public. And all of our exhibits, all of the animals that are here, are here to be animal ambassadors to teach uh, the people in New York and who come to visit from other parts of the world about the need to be good stewards of our ocean. We also, our education department also goes out to various classrooms and special interest groups and stuff like that and gives uh, education seminars and classes on the same kind of thing, how to take care of our ocean and the other areas of our planet. But what the Wildlife Conservation Society also does is runs uh, 300 plus field conservation programs in 60 countries around the world where we learn how to best care for and save wildlife around the world and basically how to influence policy so that lawmakers make responsible decisions. That's amazing. We do some great stuff here at WCS. Um, our final question is, how do the scientists who are observing the sharks help them? Um, so maybe a little bit of specifics about the work you do in the field. Um, and then what can we do to help the environment and protect sharks in the world? So she wants to know how she can help. Well, in the, as far as what WCS does, uh, with sharks right now, we are doing uh, studies of habitat use and migration and seasonal movements of sharks that swim into the New York Bight, which is the area uh, of the Atlantic Ocean offshore from New York City. Uh, and we are hoping if we learn more about their movements and about when they come into these waters and when they leave and what they are doing when they are here, uh, we can come up with, uh, with ideas and strategies to best protect them while they are here. As for what you guys can do, the most important thing you guys can do, first off, is reduce, reuse, recycle. Reduce your waste. Reuse things that can be reused. Recycle things that need to be recycled. Because a lot of the problems with the ocean are that things get dumped into the ocean that shouldn't be there. And we can minimize that ourselves at home. Uh, the other thing that you guys can do is you could become members of the Wildlife Conservation Society because your membership supports our work. Um, let's see. Well, oh, very importantly, if you guys like to eat seafood, I like to eat seafood. There's nothing wrong with eating seafood, but you can uh, make the proper seafood choices. And I think there's a link on the Wildlife Conservation Society website for a uh, responsible seafood choices uh, menu so you can choose the right type of fish to eat. So you eat something that's not overfished, that's you know healthy, the population is healthy. So those are things you all can do. Thank you. All right, awesome. We only have a few more minutes left. So I want to see if we have any questions from the Q&A app. No? If anyone, if any of our viewers have any questions they want to type in, now is your chance. So feel free to use the Q&A app to type anything you want. Even our classes could ask another question if they have one. We have a few minutes where we could open it up and anyone can ask a question. We'll give them a minute to see if anybody has anything. I was, I'm just letting them ask. I'm waiting to see if anybody has one. All right, while we're waiting, do you have anything else? Oh, here, classroom. Does somebody have something they want to add? Okay. While we're waiting, does any, do you have anything additional you'd like for our viewers and our participants to know about your work, about the sharks, or about marine science in general? I just want to say I'm really happy to have the opportunity to do this, but I'm also, it's interesting when I talk to people in classrooms, you know, people have a very, very healthy respect for sharks, their place in the ocean, and 
you know, people have a real love for sharks now. When I was a kid, many, many years ago, most people were just terrified of sharks. And all the questions were about attacks and sharks biting people. And it seems that everybody sort of realizes that is a, something that almost never happens. It's such a rarity that sharks have a lot more to fear from people than people do from sharks. And it's cool that you guys know that. We have a couple of questions on Twitter that I just found, which are on Twitter. Oh, there's. Oh, you just sent me. Sorry, I have a couple. I have a couple of questions coming in right now, which are. Sorry. All right. Um, someone asked what we feed them. I think you went over that, but you want to just make another note of a couple of things? Yes, we feed them uh, commercially harvested fish. This is the part that we didn't really talk about. We get our fish in you know, 30, 40,000 pounds at a time. It is caught and fresh frozen on a boat, the food fish. We store it in a freezer the day before we feed them. We defrost the fish. and uh, So they get fresh defrosted fish. Uh, herring, capelin, squid, and shrimp. Uh, someone asked, um, we put up a slide earlier of uh, you in the field tagging sharks. So they were curious about how, what that process is like. How do you tag a shark? Yes. Um, the picture, what we were doing was we were putting an acoustic tag inside the body cavity of a sand tiger shark. And uh, the picture you saw was we, we fish for them just like we catch regular fish. Um, we roll them over on their back, which puts them to sleep. Uh, the person in the picture with me is a veterinarian, and she implants a little transmitter inside the shark. We sew them up, we wake them up, and we let them go. Um, every year, for several years, we're able to track these sharks, and when they come back in of the Great South Bay in New York, by the use of these carefully placed listening devices around the Great Shark Bay. Bay sorry, uh, as the shark swims around the bay. But basically, the picture you saw is we had caught a shark, and we were just finishing up the tagging procedure. We did a health exam on him, and we let him go. All right, awesome. Sounds like a really great process, very cool. Uh, something that would be fun to participate in. Uh, we had one more question, which was, <laughs> um, what? Erin, what was the question? Oh, there's a bunch. There's a bunch of questions now. I'm going to come a little closer to the computer. Uh, where is the aquarium we're at? I guess I didn't say that at the beginning. I forgot to say that it's the New York Aquarium. So we are located in the New York Aquarium in Coney Island, which is in technically in Queen, Brooklyn. It's Brooklyn, New York. One more question, which is. How many species of sharks are there in the world? Do you happen to know that? It might be. Yeah, you know, that's probably a topic for debate, but I'm going to give you a, a round number. It's about 375 species of sharks. The reason I say it's a debatable question is some, some people would say there's more, some people would say there's less, depending upon how they divide up the species. But I'm going to tell you it's about 375. That's a pretty good number of sharks. All right, well, we are out of time. Thank you, everyone, so much for participating in our Hangout. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties for those classrooms live on air, but I hope we got to answer all of your questions. Um, again, I'm Kelsey Kovner. This is Hans Walters. And we are from the New York Aquarium. Uh, this recording is going to go live. It's going to go onto YouTube, so if anybody wants to see it after this, it will be on the Wildlife Conservation Society's YouTube page and just called the Hangout on Air with Sharks for World Oceans Day. Oh, and reminder, today is World Oceans Day, so it's a great opportunity to think about the oceans that we live in. There's a picture up of the New York seascape, which is all the biodiversity right here off the coast of New York City. And thank you again to all of our classrooms who participated. And that was um, a set, our seventh grade class from Bleaker Junior High School, our third grade class from Pelham Elementary School, and our fourth grade class from Ann Sullivan Elementary School. So thank you so much, and we are going to go off air. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone.